welcome you all back to Human Humane Architecture, the show here from Honolulu, Hawaii, that looks into the so desirable uh, compliance between a natural and a built environment. And if we can get the first picture up here, this is actually my first show here in what we call the uh, 3.0 version of Think Tech Hawaii here in our new Tropical Brutalist building in downtown Honolulu on Bishop Street. And the last show, um, DeSoto is here with me and he's actually in his archives in the museum as one of the new features here that were uh, present at different places in on the island and in the world potentially here. And our last show, DeSoto, we basically did when I was still back in Germany and you were sitting here. And yes. Back, we look. We feel a little bad because we had to, you know, report on a high-end luxury exclusive retail store, which we usually try to shy away. But we're sorry. That's the best we can find as of now. Correct. as new architecture on the island. Right. So, right. So that being said, um, uh, I'm still a little jet laggy here. So the first picture is sort of, sort of alluding to that and giving a little bit of a background on what I was doing there besides visiting, uh, you know, family and friends at the firm. And at the top right is a reference from our last show when uh, our boys uh, and their ladies were with me to a little sightseeing in downtown Berlin, our capital city in Germany. And I, as architects, again, um, as everyone else, the new year, it shouldn't just be about commerce and consumption, about retail, but it should be about reflection of the values we share and the people we look up to. And us as architects do that particularly. We, and we, we want to encourage our emerging generation to have heroes, people you look up to. And our friend Lon Lindgren uh, shared with us that one of the guys he looks up to is a British guy, a British architect named John Parson. And this is a book, a recent book, Spectrum, that he just purchased for himself as a Christmas gift. And the person I look up to is a fellow British uh, man, uh, Sir David Chipperfield, at, at the top left. Um, I'm privileged to call him an informal mentor of mine for the last two decades. So I and my uh, boys and girls were checking out some of his recent projects in Berlin. At the bottom left, you see his new just completed entrance building on the museum island. And at the bottom right, you see Mies van der Rohe's uh, National Gallery that he is remodeling. And at the, at the middle on the, on the right, you see a New York Times feature of him that says he wants no Chipperfield foot fingerprint on the building of his master and, and mentor Mies. So that being yes. said, uh, the National Gallery was actually one of Mises' last projects and built in 1968. And that gets us to the next page, slowly but surely getting back to the United States, but not yet here to our very west, but sort of on the other side, a little bit west of the other side here in Chicago, Illinois, where they don't have the Pacific Ocean, but the Lake Michigan. And uh, yes. they also have a Lakeshore Drive. And the building you see at the very left is actually two protégés of Mies van der Rohe, Heinrich and Schipperade. In the same year of the National Gallery in Berlin, they built this in 68. This is Lake Point Tower. It was at that time the tallest residential structure in the world out of concrete. And it's sharing that sort of record, world record with a building here in town, which is the Alamoana Hotel, built in the early 70s. That was... Uh, the tallest uh, structure as a hotel in concrete. And you see in the middle, you see Mies van der Rohe quite some years later at a project that he's mostly known for. This is high-rise residential, downtown living, lakeshore drive apartments. And to the right, you see from my prairie days, uh, basically having the emerging generation out there, we discovered this integrated grocery store that this lady with her blue home dress was walking her sweet potato up. So would you have imagined <laughs> that you could call me as a sustainable architect because he was recognizing you don't have to go into your multi-story underground parking garage and drive to the next big box store, you get your food. So right. the, the bottom are details from Lake Point Tower. They have this really opaque plinth and then this very sort of impressive hole cut in that you enter through a mouse hole and then you look up at the tower and get this dramatic view that you see at the very bottom left. So getting us to the next slide and slowly but surely uh, back to our islands here, the, the top one is a panoramic view that 
wants to take us on this little cruise on our Sunset Boulevard, starting at the Gold Coast to the very right, and then cruising along. Um, and at the bottom, you can see uh, that the buildings we admire the most are all from the later mid-century. You see at the very right, uh, Edwin Bauer's Lagoon Tower from 1967. Next to it, uh, John Graham's Illikai, 1964. And next to that is prior project, the Alamana uh, office building as part of the mall from 61, at that time, the tallest office building in town. And then comes where, uh, thanks to Alexei and his family, they hosted our PI mobile for the last three weeks. This is uh, 1315 Alamana Boulevard by Yamazaki. And uh, next slide, we allow ourselves to say that everything that has happened in between really can't basically compete as far as integrity with these sort of uh, classical masterpieces. At the bottom here, you can see how isolated and pioneering the outstate of 1350 was. And at the top left, you see a recent development, Diamond Head side of that, that is called Park Lane. Uh, and then on the top right, you can see what has happened ever side of 1315 Alamana Boulevard, which are all pretty hermetic, invasive glass boxes. So yeah. not what the other yes. ones were as being very exotic, uh, as exotically tropical buildings, right? Correct. And right, next right. slide, um, gets us to uh, the next neighborhood. This is Kaka'ako. And uh, we've been waiting. This, uh, you know, they this is where what Warehouse was. It got torn down. Then they pulled the Richard Meyer Twin Towers to make it into a park. And we were and we were reporting about the second row Ginny Gang ambitious building. And we were thinking, OK, when do they tell us what greatest building they will put there? And and you made this a Christmas grift for me of sort of a bittersweet kind. And <laughs> next slide, and you please tell me and show us what that Christmas gift looked like. Well, while you were in Germany, uh, there was a big newspaper ad, and I took photos of it and sent them to you because it was announcing the construction of yet another condo as part of the Howard Hughes development. And this is called Victoria Place, and it is going to occupy what had been the diamond head end of the Ward Warehouse property. And I'm not looking at the slides right now, so I apologize for not being able to um, say things in the correct order. But one of the things that really struck us, as we always are talking about, and you can change the slide if it's necessary, is that this building, again, is a large glass box. And what we are lacking are the lanais that we should have on tropical buildings and we're here in the tropics and that's what we should be having and in fact this building does not apparently have them and is this where we we see the picture also of joey and clara well that's the next one let's finish okay. this picture because it doesn't look yes it doesn't look anything like the reference to the show with richard lowe who had sort of reflected on these wonderful uh skinny tropical exotic stacked lanai buildings that uh, steve Ao was proposing for that area correct and next slide right. is, in fact, the one uh, that looks deeper into the building here. And yeah, talk about what struck you with a picture of Joey and Clara in Berlin. Yeah, well, you sent me a photograph last night, in fact, of your son, Joey, and his girlfriend, Clara, on their lanai in their apartment building in Berlin. And this is a picture taken in December, and it's cold. But yet they are sitting in this protected space with the low afternoon sun, and they're just wearing T-shirts. So if that can happen in Berlin, it certainly should be happening here in Honolulu. Yeah, and that's what you see at the top right. And then you also see uh, two pictures from your uh, museum, DeSoto, of Victoria oh, yes. and her mansion. And then they claim on their website that that has something to do with the project that we see on all the other pictures. And I have to say at the bottom right, you see the building and another building in the back. And both buildings are by the same architect that gets us back to Chicago. They're about uh, uh, Cortwell Solomon Buens out of Chicago. And they already did design this sort of intestine, uh, you know, eluding <laughs> project in the back that has no lanais and then they do it again. And we, we, right. we get a little impatient and angry and we said, hey, city officials, built this into code, into law, that every building has to have a significantly deep and decent yes. lanai. If you can do it in Berlin, that's your point. You should be yeah. able to do it where you can use it year round, right? Exactly. And next exactly. slide here, 
is is us renting uh, one uh, one more time here because these are pictures off top left of the exterior of that one and it has this vertical slabs that uh, when I was back in the Howard Hughes uh, uh, headquarters uh, spying there I saw this book on the bottom left that is the brochure of the Genie Game project and they they were basically promoting and branding it as an exoskeleton and again as we already indicating and here's a reference to the top right this is Edwin Bauer's Lagoon Tower it, that was doing it way more effectively efficiently and poetically half a century ago so you guys you Correct, got it right. better because in in yeah. your favorite terms of the evolution on the uh tradition of innovations if you if you build something new here it got to be better than anything that was right. the, the mid-century stuff right. was pretty good right that's our point yes absolutely so absolutely. next slide here um is the next parcel is pretty much where Ward Plaza was. That got Correct. torn down, and we don't know what's happening there. So for the time being, we're bold enough to place a Primitiva here at the top top left, yeah. which we think right. is most along the lines of uh, show reference to here there are, up and running, stronger than ever, uh, Mr. Richard Lowe and Steve Al. So right. next slide, uh, we basically now get to the Kamehameha School art of Kaka'ako. Here is uh, Robert Oda showing us his projects. The very one on the left, the Vida by Architonica got pulled, but the one in front of him at the very right is the collection. And we, while we were thinking, okay, they're not using a Hawaiiana washing name, but again, yes. it's called collection. And what is a collect? It collects a lot of money and a lot of solar gain that we don't need. So what, what the hell right. is that? Hot the right, hell. right. Next slide. Right. Um, and, and, and the next part of town is this one. And where is that and what is that, soil? Well, we're looking at downtown Honolulu. This is our aerial view, correct? Yeah. And uh, this is a, a postcard that you purchased fairly recently. And obviously, if we were to go back in time to the early 1970s, a bunch of those high-rises wouldn't be there. But yet in this very scenic and very important, historically important business center, there are some different towers that are different from everybody else that you can see on the far right of the cluster of high rises those are different because they are not office buildings but they are residences they are two condo towers in downtown honolulu they were pioneering at the time they were built because there weren't any other buildings like that in downtown and that's what we're going to be looking at from here on Exactly, that's what we see. So we were desperately looking, even your archives didn't have in early 1970s, we wouldn't right. see then most of these, but the one on the very right, that's basically nearing and bordering the governmental center of downtown. Correct. Right. So now we're at this building, which is a pioneer, because as you said, this is like almost every downtown in the United States, a very monofunctional, just working city. Yes. But someone had basically pioneered that and brought a uh, downtown horizontal dwelling into that and that gets us to the next slide because at this point we would wish we would have someone other than us because we know a little to nothing about it but we wish we would have someone who knows about it and this brings back to my memory of friend ron and why don't right. we two, why don't the two of us materialize ron to be with us now and share with us exactly can we do this really? ron speak up you, your powers have worked because here I am. <laughs> there happy he is. Here to you both. I'm so happy to be back with you again. And Thank you for I'm, being I'm here to with. talk uh, as a representative of my boss, mentor, and friend, Ed Killingsworth, who designed in 1971 uh, the Harbor Square apartments that you're seeing in that slide. And this was really one of the largest urban developments in downtown Honolulu and the largest that Ed ever completed. Uh, a 26-story condo office development that covers an entire block. And there were 360 condo units, all one and two bedrooms uh, in the towers. And then the podiums themselves contained parking, offices, a one-time busy restaurant, and, of course, the elevator lobbies to reach the, top, the condo towers and the offices. And in the next slide... But before we do I'm, that, Ron, why don't you point yes. out the little side plan at the bottom right in reference Oh, yes, to... I'm so sorry. That's uh, The bottom plan is uh, two residential towers at round floor plan that Mies van der Rohe uh, designed uh, in Chicago. 
And I'm actually making the case that uh, when you look to the left of the photograph of the two towers that created Harbor Square, that in some respects there's even an improvement in plan because no tower looks directly at themselves as it does in the Mies uh, paired towers. They, they look past each other. The views slide past each other's elevations. Mm -hmm. And that's the project we were referenced to at the beginning of the show. So here again, uh, you know, Mies might have been sort of an inspiration for Ed as well. And as you always point out that Ed was a classicist and sure Mies was with Schinkel being his great master. So here we can say, at two decades after Lakeshore Drive Apartments, he was basically homaging to that and maybe even optimizing, improving that, right? Yeah. And notice, of course, there are lanai's everywhere, as we'll talk about in greater detail later. And as we talked before, and as we will continue to talk about, because it should be law here, right? And here it was. Yep. Go to the next slide and share more with us, Ron. And here you are. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm the, I was there in, uh, in Honolulu recently as one of the featured speakers at Noko Momo's National S Symposium. And Martin, Martin was so kind to uh, drive me around in his beautiful car. And I have a close relationship with uh, Harbor Square. Uh, Ed took some of his profits from designing Harbor Square and bought a one-bedroom apartment facing east towards Waikiki, and it had a wonderful 180-degree view from the mountains to the ocean. And if you move to the next slide, I, uh, Harbor Square for me was a home away from home. I often uh, stayed there by myself, sometimes with co-workers, sometimes with Ed Killingsworth himself, uh, in this 865-square-foot uh, one-bedroom and very spacious unit. Uh, if you look at the, at the next slide, there's a detail about Harbor Square before we look at it in its uh, in its immensity, and that is that up until up uh, early, well, actually in the later 19th century, there used to be a freestanding building on the site called the Honolulu Sailors' Home. And, uh, as a result of the of, of uh, zoning uh, requirements and his, history, uh, that Sailors' Home had to be incorporated into uh, the design of Harbor Square at grade. And if you go to the next slide, I seem to be gazing uh, wonderingly up into a tree. But what I'm showing here is this is such an urban project. The buildings, uh, the podium buildings go right out to the sidewalks. There's only really one garden space, and it's this lovely, rather semi secluded space, which also provides access to elevators that lead to office spaces and to the uh, one of the uh, condo towers and on in the next slide i believe martin you had some comments yeah and if we go back to the previous slide one more time here at the top right we're referencing to our most emerging practitioner on the island bandit canista con that you Soto were uh you know quizzing him on his uh Molo'ili loft project here and he particularly yes. uh names this place and space is one of the most beautiful ones with really very contemplative character again in a very buzzly buzzy vibrant uh you know urban fabric there is this almost you know this zen and this you were zenning it there ron and and really indulging in in that quality in the back of that you see this sort of under the the arcades and under the uh you see these office spaces because it's a mixed use project that actually uh up to six stories is basically offices, and then the, the, the residential is above it. And next slide, you're right, Ron, we were looking up, and just like Bundet is a representative of the next generation that see and value the legacy of Killingsworth, and here's a tenant in there that basically started to basically strip everything off from these sort of ugly suspended you know, ceilings and all that stuff, and really purified uh, the space, just like, again, in Ed's philosophy. And, and we I started this discussion to ask you why different than Mies van der Rohe, who actually had started his very first uh, residential high-rise in Chicago, was the Promontory Apartments. That was actually a concrete building, but the concrete was left untreated and not painted. And so we got into this discussion about if you had ever asked Ed why all the concrete had always been painted and, and share your thoughts about that, uh, Ron. Yeah, uh, the a lot of a lot of uh, some of the painting coatings that were being developed uh, 
at the time in the 70s, began to really protect concrete a great deal mm -hmm. from uh, the, the deterioration that can happen over time. Especially and, here uh, the sea salt exposure, right? Exactly, and I think that's, that's per perhaps the main reason. Mm -hmm. When I look at this photograph of that ceiling, I'm reminded that Ed Killingsworth hated suspended ceilings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in almost all of his wooden buildings, uh, the underside of, of a very thin wood roof would be exposed as a beautiful wood ceiling. Mm -hmm. And in concrete buildings, as much as possible, never a suspended ceiling. That meant having to work sometimes with the electrician to get uh, lighting fixtures yeah. cast into the concrete. But that was his uh, that was his druthers. Great. So the, he would have been very happy to see this here. And let's move on. To Indeed. The next, let's move on to the next slide here. And tell us about the, the plan of the tower, this tower here. Yeah, we're going to be talking about both towers, the Harbor Tower, which is a bit larger, and the Town Tower. But the Harbor Tower uh, has all one and two bedroom units. They range in size from about 865 square feet for a one bedroom to 1,200 square feet. And you notice in plan that all of them are uh, provided with lanai's. In fact, the, the two bedroom units uh, marked units five and 10 have 25 foot wide uh, lanai's, wow. which uh, not only do they soften uh, and uh, and invigorate the elevations, but they provided great sun protection, especially for the living room that is at the center of that particular plan. And these units were thought of as being for businessmen who maybe had established themselves in Honolulu for some time mm -hmm. and would appreciate actually being able to walk to work. They were provided one parking stall included with each of their condos in the Harbor Tower. Yeah, and and a little sort of Intel sort of nickname, um, you know, secret you shared with me made me add that picture at the very top right where you see these kind of tenants uh, and you because you said that the nickname of the tower was actually the principal's tower so these that's are the correct principles you know as they looked back in the days and they probably look the same these days although then <laughs> the lower shirt came it became sort of socially correct right to soda you just had a couple yes. of exhibits about it yes. so let's move on to the next slide and look at these units and here at the lanai's and share with us what you think is so marvelous about this happened this happens to be uh, a lanai of one of the two bedroom corner units. And uh, you're not seeing it uh, furnished, although a little later we'll see some uh, pictures of just how much furniture you could put out there so that it was an outdoor room. But you're up high and looking over the city as you see in this particular uh, picture towards the mountains. So this shows uh, the ambiance and the character of what your view would have been like living in a corner unit in the Harbor Tower. Yeah, and the little references to previous shows on the top right reference again, once again, to 1315 Alamona Boulevard that was built only three years before that. And you, before the show, reminded me also should have thrown in a picture of the Kahala Hotel because while the Killingsworth over uh, um, and uh, body of work was very rectilinear, these are a few examples where you guys got swooping sexy curvy, right? That's correct. And in the next uh, slide, you'll see uh, that same corner unit, but now you're inside a living room. You see how spacious those were. Just imagine what that view at night would be with all the office lights uh, across the streets. Mm -hmm. And in the next slide down, you're, you're seeing uh, a, another unit, this time rather sparsely furnished, uh, but look at that lanai, a table, two chairs around the table, two additional chairs, and all looking out gloriously out over the harbor to the to the open ocean. That's right. And in, and in the next slide, I, this is my favorite unit. I, uh, I visited a friend who had one, although I was staying in a one bedroom. This is the clearest expression of a two bedroom unit where there are bedrooms flanking each side of a living room. That lanai is 25 feet long. 
and it is another room. It's almost, if you actually figured out the area of the Lanai, it's almost the same square footage as that of the interior living room. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is very grandeur. <laughs> And, and uh, in, the, in the next slide, you see uh, just how large that lanai is. In this case, it looks like our principals not have retired because they have some rocking chairs on their lanai. <laughs> but here again is the view uh, back over the city because you're up high enough to the mountains. And you're looking down, in fact, on the recreation deck of Harbor Square, which was the seventh floor. And, and talking and, thermal comfort, Ron, it, it reminds me of your uh, Waikiki Park Hotel recently converted into the Halapuna, where I was critical about that they had been taking away what I call side ventilation. And that's not an official term, but what I mean is that if you open the sliding doors that you see here on both ends of the lanai, you get some nice breeze through, although it's not a corner unit. In the corner units, it works even better, right? So it's a very bioclimatic proposition, right? Yes, very much so. And uh, when we uh, join together again next week, I'm really interested in showing people the second tower called the Town Tower, because as we called the Harbor Tower, the place maybe that the principals might live, you know, maybe the, the, the bankers, the head accountants, uh, the people that were uh, consultants for years, those who were established and a little bit older, the idea that Ed had for the second tower the town tower was to have smaller units, still one and two bedroom, but less expensive and more for people who maybe are new to Honolulu and just starting out their business career. So uh, we'll be looking at the plans of the uh, town tower next week and talking through that, uh, which also has Lanai's uh, provided for every unit which covers the living rooms and the bedrooms. Yeah, and to get you guys even more excited, which after what you said, I, I, I believe it's already enough exciting, but I'm chipping in another, I'm chipping in the nickname of what you gave that tower to get people even more crazy about it. So what's, what's your nickname for that tower to come? Well, this was, whereas the Harbor Tower was the principal's towers, there had to be a place for a secretary's tower. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on, on that note, I think everyone will return next week. Uh, no doubt on that. And until then, uh, thank you both so much for having, uh, you know, try to shed a light on this in the in the body of work of Killingsworth, still a rather mysterious project, because that's one of the projects where you have the least documentation. But we try to work our way through the project and there is lots of uh, very exciting stuff to come. So until then, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bishop Museum, DeSoto. Thank you, Long Beach, Ron. And see you next week for the volume two of uh, Killingsworth Honolulu uh, Harbor Square. Bye-bye. <laughs>